Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is the Broad Street Church of Christ online service for October 25th. This could be the last online service we have before we jump to live streaming. It may be another week or so. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoy the service this morning. As always, let us know anything we can do to help you. If you are needing something or needing something announced or just questioning something about a member, or have information about a member that we need to know as a church body. We want to be together, even if we can't all physically be together. I want us to be able to strengthen each other spiritually and help each other out where we're needed. Thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the service this morning. God bless you.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you would allow us to have. We thank you for this avenue of prayer uh, that we can ask you boldly uh, with confidence um, for things that we desire, uh, things that we can have concerns about. We, we thank you for this church. Uh, we thank you for all the members that are involved here. Uh, we pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we uh, continue to be Christians. I uh, pray that we, as we grow and try to be better each day, that you'll be with us and guide us. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with the elders and the deacons here. pray that as they oversee us, that uh, we'll, we'll always be headed in the right direction. Um, pray that we'll be uh, a good example, uh, a shining light in our community. We pray, Lord, for the youth of this church. pray that you'll be with them, um, that as they seek you out, that they always will seek you out um, to be an example or as for guidance. We pray, Lord, that we'll all be good examples for the youth and uh, that they can always look to us uh, to be that example. We ask your prayers, Lord, for this country. Uh, pray that as we go through a presidential election that you'll guide us all. Uh, pray that the uh, candidates that is elected will, will do a great job, uh, that we can always continue to be a Christian country. Um, we pray, Lord, that you'll be with all our citizens um, as we go through this time of unrest, uneasiness, that you'll be with us and uh, guide us all. We ask a, uh, a prayer for our military. Uh, pray that you'll be with all the members uh, that are involved in the military, um, be with their families as they're separated from each other for extended period of times. Pray that you'll watch over them, comfort them, and be with them. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with the sick of our church, um, the ones that have diseases. Pray that you'll comfort them, heal them, and give them peace. Pray that you'll be with the ones that are administering to them. Pray that they will use the knowledge that they have to successfully heal each one of them. I pray that you'll be with the members of our church that have lost loved ones. Pray that you'll heal, heal them, comfort them, and uh, that if we can do anything to uplift or encourage them, pray that we'll, we'll be able to be there for them. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with us through the rest of this service. Pray that the things that we say and do here today will be pleasing to you. We thank you most of all for your son that you sent to die on the cross for our sins. Pray that you'll forgive us our many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ the Lord is I'm sitting on the back porch this morning, as some of you may be, enjoying the sounds of nature and the morning air. I hope the sounds won't bother you or distract you. Actually, I hope you enjoy them in the event you hear them. I was thinking this week about the Bible, God's holy word, writings that are inspired, the inspired words of God, taken down by men and recorded and compiled 
Our Bible is, is our pathway. It's our guide. It's our playbook. It's where we go for encouragement and direction and information in order to start a relationship with God and to chart a pathway where that relationship can grow, you need that Bible. I think God has willed it and planned it all along and given men the, the ability to bring forth that product. Because when you think about it, the Bible was written by, well, it's 66 books written by over 40 different authors over a span of time that was nearly 2,000 years just in the writing pretty amazing and then someone at God's direction and inspiration found the ability years later to put it all together so that here in 2020 we have Bibles that we can refer to for our daily living for our encouragement for our information for our direction in a day and age where Faced with a global pandemic in our country alone, our country, which we all like to say, and I believe is so, probably the greatest civilization that mankind has ever known. We have modern technologies that are amazing. We have computer information at our fingertips and our phones. It's just amazing what men can do. Yet, in the face of a global pandemic, our directors, our leadership, our governors, our governance, we still cannot answer the question of wear masks or don't wear masks. Yet we have the Bible. We have the Bible from the very first pages where in the beginning is the phrase that we see to the very last page where we see the word amen. Amen. Translated means, so be it. All the stories from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, from the start of mankind to the end of the world as we know it, everything in between, the wars, the battles, the miracles that take place, all the prophecies, everything is centered around one thing, the fact that God loved us so much that he wished that none of us would perish so that he sent his only son that he might die, that he might die on a cruel cross, be buried, be raised from that grave and lives even now so that if we might believe that Jesus Christ was and still is the Son of God, that we might repent of our sins, be baptized for the remission of those sins, to come out of those waters a new person, a new being, seeking a relationship with God, so that when the day comes that our soul is judged, that our Father in heaven can wrap his arms around us to welcome us home, and to say, well done. Well done because we believed what we saw, what we read, what we heard from the Bible. That the only way that we could find a path to live with God forever in eternity was in believing of Jesus. In that story of Jesus we find in that Bible, that Bible written, those 66 books those over 40 authors, those over 2,000 years, with the last word being, Amen, so be it. So as we pause now and we join together around the table, may our thoughts turn back to that Bible and that story and that cross and our God who loves us so that that sacrifice was made for us. And this bread represents the very body of Christ as he hung on that cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that you crafted a plan, Lord, a simple plan, one that we can learn from our Bible. 
Lord, if we would just believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and we take and follow all the steps required of us, our repentance, our baptism, our seeking you in a relationship, that, Father, that would allow us to remain with you forevermore. We pray that as we take this bread, that we do so in a way, Lord, that you can look down and be pleased with us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now let's bless the cup. Father, we again thank you so much for the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf in this very cup, which represents the blood that you spilled for us on that cross. Lord, again, may we do this in a way that pleases you. And we thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen. so much for being with us today for the worship service of the Broad Street Church of Christ. I'm so blessed to have this opportunity to come into your home today and share with you a message from God's Word. You know, most of the people that I know like to make uh, New Year's uh, resolutions. They like to plan for the future. They like to ask questions about what can happen in a certain period of time and what can they accomplish. And they're interested in these things to the point that uh, some folks literally stress themselves out over it. But today we're going to see something a little different in that regard, not merely a matter of stress, but also a matter of wrongdoing. And that's something will be the topic of our subject of today. Don't leave God out of your plans. Some people look at their futures through purely carnal or earthly or, uh, eyes in which they are uh, trying to calculate for themselves what kind of education they'd like to have, 
uh, what sort of person would they like to marry and would this per person be the right person to marry? What sort of uh, careers would they like to pursue? And what kind of career would be necessary in order to support the lifestyle that they think that they would like to live? Now, these individuals seem innocent enough because we all tend to talk about New Year's resolutions, but I want to show you today a matter that, that needs to be dealt with in that respect. There are people, unfortunately, who have resorted to things like consulting tea leaves to help dictate their future. And there are people that have uh, gone to palm readers and uh, used other means such as astrology and reading of the stars and the relationship of stars to each other to help decide whether they should or should not do certain things at a certain time. Uh, then there are other people who look at their lives entirely through spiritual eyes spiritual considerations. They want to know uh, all that they can know about matters of salvation and how to please God. They want to know about uh, spiritual growth and how do we grow in the Lord and uh, in the power of his word and how do we uh, serve others. And they are interested in knowing matters about uh, matters that pertain to going to heaven or being lost eternally in, in hell and eternally cut off from God. And these people make their choices under the influence of that spiritual reality. These are individuals that are considering God in every choice that they make. And with that in mind, I want to stress to you, first of all, that looking ahead and planning ahead in and of and by itself is not wrong. For example, in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, the apostle Paul and Barnabas had completed their first missionary journey. And Paul said to Barnabas in that verse, let's go again to uh, visit our brethren in any, every city that we've preached. They want to go back and uh, and go back and see how they were doing. That's Acts 15 and verse 36. Uh, and they were looking ahead. They were planning ahead. Now, in that particular verse, they did not say the phrase that we're going to really focus on today. But in Acts 18, verse 20 and 21, at Ephesus, uh, while Paul is there in the second missionary journey, uh, they desired that he would stay with them longer. And uh, he said that he couldn't do that, that he really needed to be in Jerusalem for the feast day. And with that in mind, he said that he would return again to them. And he adds a phrase, if God wills, he would come back to them if God wills. And he called and he sailed from Ephesus to Caesarea back to Antioch and ended his second missionary journey uh, recorded in the book of Acts. It's, it's a very strong phrase. Here's a man that's telling people that here's what I plan to do, but he's accepting the fact that someone else has real control of these matters. And he's saying, if God wills. Now in first Corinthians chapter 16, verses five to nine, uh, Paul told the Corinthians that he would see them again after he uh, came through Macedonia, but that he planned to stay at Ephesus uh, until Pente or until after Pentecost. And again, he asked the phrase, if the Lord permit, if God wills or if the Lord permit. Now, here is a man who is making plans for the future, but he's making them in view of if this is according to God's will. If this is something that God would approve of and that God would allow to happen. And that makes all the difference in the world and whether we are being carnal and self-centered in our planning or whether or not we are including God in these decisions. It's just one of the keys to our success is making plans and looking to the future. But the real key to that is making certain that we're doing it the right way there is a right way, there is a wrong way, and the wrong way is to leave God out of the consideration. And so James, in the little book that he has recorded in our New Testament, addresses this matter. And in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, I'd like to read this paragraph to you. James writes, Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there for a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what will be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away, for that you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and uh, that we will do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, and all such rejoicing is evil. 
And therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This is a, a description not of a particular individual in the first century, but of a kind of an individual. The kind of individual that would plan ahead impulsively and do the things that, that suited his heart's desire, uh, but would not take God into consideration. And that first century man may have some counterparts in the 21st century man, which makes it relevant to our discussion time today. Here is a man had already planned, very carefully laid it all out. He had planned a period of time. Uh, and in that period of time, he was said that uh, today or tomorrow, we will go into a certain city. So he also has uh, planned uh, the target city. And we will stay there for a period of time. He says we'll continue there for a year. So he's planned the period of time uh, that he planned to be there. But he has also planned his procedure that we will buy and we will sell. His idea was to go into town, buy cheap, sell higher, make a profit at the end of the year, come home lavishly covered with the riches of a, of a very successful year. But he hadn't included God's will in those plans. And James says that he ought to have said, if the Lord will, verse 15, if the Lord will, uh, we shall live and do this or that. And this man was rejoicing over these things. He plans his procedure. He plans his time period. He plans his profit, almost as if to him, it's a guaranteed thing that he will just go in and, and really rake in the money. So these thoughts of planning are wrong in and of themselves if a person is not consulting God about it. But if a person is consulting God about it, making plans, I stress again, is not a bad thing. Well, the question really for us today is, uh, are we considering God in our plans? In verse 15, for we ought to say, if the Lord will, we will do this or do that. Through the years, I've tried to make it a common practice that when I say, I'll see you next week, Lord willing, and I'm not just doing that for showmanship. First of all, I'm doing it to remind myself that I don't know that there'll be a next week in my life. I'm also wanting to remind the person that I'm talking to that there are situations that come up that, that might preclude my being able to carry out what I had hoped that I would do. And if it's the will of the Lord that I can, I would like to see you next week. And it doesn't hurt us at all to take time and develop the, the good habit but not just out of a habit, but out of a very thoughtful heart, the good practice of verbally saying, if the Lord wills. But this man didn't say that. He didn't say, Lord, what is your will for me? So what's happened here is that we have an individual who has committed some very serious and some very grievous problems. He's guilty of what we call self-centered planning. And that's a mistake that we need to be, be very leery of in our lives today, self-centered planning. And in that category of self-centered planning, uh, it's important for you and I to find out what the will of God is. If the Lord wills, uh, we must submit our plans uh, to God's will in those matters. In Acts 18, Paul said, if God's will, uh, if God wills uh, to the uh, Ephesians concerning wanting to come back there after he made his trip to Jerusalem. And he is considering God in that plan. In 1 Corinthians 16, 7, if the Lord permits, that's his way of saying the same thing. Uh, I will come to you at Corinth if the Lord permits. And saying if the Lord wills assumes that we have faith uh, in two things. Number one, that God does have a will for us. And God, number two, can intervene through the power of his providence. And when we recognize that, we are yielding ourselves to God's will. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. It's up to God what is best for me, not up to me. And I have to consider what is God's pleasure? What would God most like for me to do? What kind of person would he most like for me to be? God does have a will, and he can, through his providence, intervene in our lives today. If we really want to plan to succeed, then we will seek, first of all, to know what that will is. It is uh, for it is God who 
works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. God's will, it is his will that is so important here. To a great degree, it's possible for God to uh, want us to do things that he's very clearly revealed in the scriptures. And so in the writing of uh, Paul in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, his prayer for them was that they would not be unwise, but they would understand what the will of the Lord is. There are some things that are biblical by their very definition, and therefore God does have specific and revealed will about those matters. For example, in considering the kind of person that uh, one should marry, we certainly should consider what is God's will in this matter. God would want you to marry someone that would uh, be compatible with your desire to go to heaven, not someone that would pull you astray and try to lead you off into a ungodly, an ungodly and a very worldly uh, practice. Certainly God would not want anyone to marry someone that would drag them down and pull them away from trying to live for Jesus. The will of God is clear in those matters in the sense of saying what the priorities in our lives need to be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For example, in Matthew 6 and verse 33, when we're seeking God's kingdom first and the will of God first, uh, we turn to the revealed word. And we come to understand what God sees as the most important thing. And it's most important that we be faithful. And it's most important that we have uh, companions who will help us to be faithful and that we in turn can help them to be faithful. In Romans 12 and verse 2, Paul writes that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When you and I prove the perfect will of God, basically what he's saying there is that by testing that we might discern or come to understand what the will of the Lord is. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 5 and verse 14 uses a similar word when he tells us of individuals who had come of age and were able to handle the strong meat of the word of God, having their senses discerned between good and evil. Through their trials and through their experiences, they had come to see what's healthy in the eyes of God and what's not healthy for the individual in the eyes of God. These verses were relating to his uh, revealed will, things that we can know about him. For example, when I go for a job search, it's important for us to look for a job that will not interfere with our living the Christian life. Uh, I can't, uh, for the life of me, imagine that God would be happy with me being a barkeeper. I can't imagine God being happy with me being one that would tend the bar and pour up the drinks and help people get just as drunk as, as we could get them because after all, the bars are interested in primarily making a profit. Uh, there might be some social uh, involvement where they are interested remotely in, in helping people, but you don't help people by tearing them down by helping feed their drunkenness. Not saying there that I know that every barkeeper is only interested in that one thing. I'm merely saying that it just is not consistent with the conduct of a Christian to be aiding and abetting people in getting drunk. Uh, that's why I also should never think about me driving for a brewery and delivering all of these beverages to the stores. Uh, I'm not telling you what you can and cannot do, but for me, these things are contrary to the very nature of the Christian life and the example that we should set for other people. I've known of individuals that were so deeply entrenched in the study of the Word of God that over the years of proving and testing the will of God, they had come to realize that even working at the particular plant or factory that they were working in was interfering with their ability to worship God on the first day of the week with the saints. And the saints had made it very convenient for them by offering two separate times of gathering, a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. Uh, they tell me that this actually began uh, around World War II when uh, shift work uh, became very prevalent and people were working a night shift as well as a day shift and a mid shift. 
And so the saints would have more than one time of gathering on the first day of the week to break bread so that those who were working the morning shift would still have a time to worship because of the war going on. And what I'm suggesting here very simply is that uh, that these are individuals that uh, were in the factories, the ones who were wanting to evaluate whether they should change jobs or not, they were not being allowed a time that they could come to worship on the Lord's Day, not even a Sunday evening for a separate worship period. I have known of individuals who have actually given up their jobs and gone into different lines of work because they were considering what the will of the Lord says about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I don't want to write a law for God and tell you you can't work on Sunday. I want to make a positive suggestion. And that positive suggestion is that we need to plan where we work in harmony with being able to worship God on a consistent basis. And he calls for his saints to come together on the first day of the week, based on Hebrews 10 and verse 25, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Saints are to come together and worship God on the first day of the week, he says there. And with that in mind, I suggest to you that we are to test and we are to prove and learn uh, discern what his will is. Would God be happy with the choice of who I marry? Would God be happy with the choice of the kind of career field that I go into and the compromises that it may force upon me? Of, For example, offering wine and beer parties uh, for the company employees uh, when it's my turn and it gets passed around to me. I can't do that. I cannot participate in serving people alcoholic beverages that can lead to either their addiction or their drunkenness or both. Just simply, we have to discern in light of would this be pleasing to God. I'm not trying to write rules for you. I'm trying to suggest to you that God has spiritual wills where there is a right and a wrong. But there's another kind of, of decision that can be made in which we still should consider what is God's will but in cases in which there is not a specific right or wrong answer. For example, if an individual is trying to decide whether to move to uh, this particular city over here or that particular city over there, there may not be just a right or wrong answer to that question. The truth is that God is able to bless to a happy outcome those who would do his will in either of those cities. It's not a matter of whether it's the right or wrong. Sometimes it's a matter of good, better, and best. Or maybe one would offer you the best opportunity or a better opportunity or a good opportunity, and the other may not. And so those are factors that we look at, but we still pray to God for the wisdom to make the right choice. And in that category, we're talking about God's permissive will, meaning to say he didn't legislate in the scriptures a principle that's being violated as to whether I live here or whether I live in another state or another another city, uh, but rather still search out his will. Uh, Paul would not have been wrong not to have gone back to Corinth, uh, but when he committed himself to going back, he qualified it by saying, if the Lord permits, if the Lord wills, I'd like to come back. And that's, my plans are to come back in that regard. But th these are the non-biblical uh, no no law of God uh, categories where God didn't say you can't do it. Uh, God can bless either decision in these kinds of, of, of matters. For example, in Romans 8 and verse 28, the apostle writes there, we know that all things work together for good. Who to Who is it to? To them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. God can turn something good out of my living in town X or Y or Z. God can still turn something good out of that. If we love the Lord and if we seek his will and if we are called according to his purpose. In Romans chapter 8, uh, we were in verse 28, back up to verse 14. And there he says, as many of us uh, as are led by uh, the spirit of God, we are the sons of God. If we're being guided and led by God's spirit, and God's spirit has revealed himself to us through his sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And if we're being guided by the word of God, 
uh, to make our decisions wholesomely and spiritually right, according to God's spiritual will, God can, in this sense of the word, uh, cause all things to work together for good if we're being led by the Spirit and, and therefore are children of God. So biblically, we need to understand what his will is, and we need to be filled with that will, and then we need to test to see if what we're doing is in accordance with his will. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, David wrote some powerful words. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. John writes in 1 John 1 verse 5 and 6 that if a man walks in darkness, but if he says that he's walking in the truth, he's lying and not doing the truth if we're walking in darkness. You know, I'd like to ask you a thought question today. Do you, do you have an idol in your heart? Most people would quickly say, oh, no, I, I don't have an idol. You know, we don't have idols in America, but yes, we do. Anything that we love more than we love God becomes our idol or that which we worship. Anything that we serve more than we serve God becomes that which we worship and serve. An idol is anything that you fear more than the wrath of God or awesomely respect in the other definition of the word fear. Anything that you awesomely respect more than you awesomely respect God or tremble and quake at his wrath. Uh, anything that you fear, either way you use that word, it's relevant here. Ezekiel 14 and verse three, son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and they have put a stumbling block uh, of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of by all of them? This is God talking to his preacher, his prophet, Ezekiel, son of man is what he calls him. These people have set up idols in their hearts. Is it right for them to expect to ask me to bless them? What right do they have to come to me and ask me to guide them if they have set up idols in front of me. We need to be so certain that we're not putting any earthen treasure or any earthen ambition ahead of our ambition of serving God. If you want to know what God's will for your future is, make certain, number one, that you have no habitual sin that you dwell in and make no effort to repent of or, and to put it out of your life. That's where... David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. But if we can be penitent and genuinely be trying to change our lives, God will hear us. But if we put earthen treasures and earthen ambitions ahead of God, he says, what right do you have to turn and expect me to bless you if you haven't put me first? That's what we would say in a nutshell about a person who has self-centered planning. Self-centered planning not considering God and if the Lord will. In James chapter four, verse 13 to 17, he opens up another possibility, and that is that men and women could be so wrapped up in self-confident presumption, taking too much for granted. That man who said, I'm going into a certain city for a certain period of time, I'm going to do certain things, and I'm going to make gain, and then I'm going to come back rich. That man was being very presumptuous, presumption and self-confidence in their future. I assert to you today that this could very easily be the last sermon I ever preach. I have no guarantee of tomorrow. This could be the very last sermon that you have the opportunity to hear. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. And with the COVID virus causing the death of so many people, I think more of us are in sync with that comment that we don't really know, do we? And we do the best that we can to guard and to, to take precautions. But the bottom line is, I cannot afford to be presumptuous and self, overly self-confident in my tomorrows. One of my church secretaries in my second ministry in Oklahoma years and years and years ago, lovely lady, uh, she was like a, a mother in a sense to me. I was a very young preacher. And she 
uh, was of mature age and uh, had grown children. She came down with a inoperable an, an inoperable uh, brain tumor. I would go to the house to have prayer with her and her family. And in talking with her, she always ended our conversation by saying, the will of the Lord be done. I took that to heart. This lady was a genuine believer. God's will be done with my life. She did not lay there in grief and remorse that she might not get to be around much longer. The will of the Lord be done. The wise man Solomon wrote in Proverbs 27 and verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. We should not be presumptuous and overly confident. Jesus tells the story of the rich farmer that had such a good crop that he was going to tear down his barns and build more, and uh, that he would just have plenty to last him for the rest of his life. And then in that story that the Lord told, he just, the Lord speaks to him and says, Thou fool, this night shall thy soul be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be? You see, that man was far too presumptuous. That's Luke chapter 12. Go back and, and read verses 16 through 20 for that full story. And the third thing that is wrong that's pointed out in this text has to do with not just self-centered planning and not just self-confident presumptions, but also uh, self-satisfied complacency and putting off more important things, procrastination. He says, whereas you ought to say, the Lord wills we will do these things. But then he adds, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Friends, procrastinating and not doing that which we know to do, the sin of omission, the sin of failing to get around to it. What are the sins of omission? Why does he say to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not? And I believe it's because procrastinating and putting off and failing to do has led to the spiritual corruption of many people. It's led to the destruction of many marriages. It has led many churches to fail the sin of omission, of failing to do that which we know is good. And he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, James 1 and verse 17, uh, James 4 verse 17, uh, and, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, friends, we think about our futures, but now we should beware when we think about them of any kind of self-centered planning. Let's include God in our will. And furthermore, self-confident presumption, presumptions. Let's not take for granted that we have tomorrow, but if it's the will of the Lord, we'll do this or we will do that. And let's not put off until tomorrow what needs to be done today. I feel confident that I may be talking to some individuals who have never obeyed the gospel, who've never become New Testament Christians, who've never been baptized into Christ and added to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church as it was described on the pages of the New Testament. Today, we end our thoughts by offering heaven's invitation for some who would like to be a part of that New Testament church. You know what you ought to do if you've studied the Bible and you know that a person needs to, to hear the word of God and become a believer, that God is and that he rewards the diligent seeker and that Jesus really is the Son of God, and confessed that faith in Jesus. For he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And based upon our repentance of our sins, where we turn away from a life of sin and turn towards serving a living God, we hear, we believe, we repent of our sins, we confess the name of Jesus Christ, these things are done simultaneously almost, and sometimes they're done in progression where we grow in maturity to where we can do more and more and more. But they ultimately lead to the same place. Every conversion in the book of Acts ended at that same place. The very same hour of the night, uh, they were baptized. For you see, Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts 2.38, his inspired preacher Peter said that they were to repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Do you want to face your future? Face your future by believing in God today. Face your future by repenting of your sins. And uh, 
confessing that Jesus truly is God's only begotten son and our only savior and taking on his death to be your own by being buried by baptism into his death and raised up to walk in the newness of life. That's Romans chapter six, verses three to six. Face your future by including God's will, his inspired will into your life and watch God work day by day in your life for good to come. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord, Romans 8, 28. That doesn't mean everything happening to me is good, but it means that these things can work for good. And good can result if we love the Lord and if we're called according to his purpose, putting God's purpose ahead of my purpose. That's the aim of our, of our subject today. Would you pray with me? Father of mercies, we come to you in prayer on behalf of any and all who might be hearing our voice today. And we pray, Lord, that we've not in any way misrepresented the intent of your scriptures. But help them search the scriptures to be certain that those things are so. And then, Lord, if they have not become New Testament Christians, may they be moved today to contact us or someone nearby who offers the same saving message from the Bible and help him to obey the gospel today before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. If you have questions about our lesson, be sure to give us a call at the number that's being shown on the screen right now. We'd be happy to call you back if you leave a message on that answering service. Thank you again, and God bless. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity and opportunities like this that we're able to come together and worship you. And please help us to do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. And please help us as we leave this worship hour 
to go about our lives in a manner that is pleasing to you, not just when we are worshiping, but when we are doing anything, whether we're around other people, whether we're around our church, or whether we're by ourselves. Help us to act in a manner that is pleasing to you and in a way that you would be proud of and that we would be proud to share. Uh, Please be with those that are hurting and sick and all those that need our extra special attention, uh, families and sick and those that have lost loved ones. There are so many uh, that are struggling right now in this present time. Please be with them and help them and help us to do what we need to do to be there for them, whatever that may be. Thank you for everything we have. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ and his love for us and his sacrifice and you sending him to this earth to do that for us. We ask all of these things, whatever is your will, not ours. And in Jesus Christ's precious name we pray, amen.